About a year ago, my stepsister Sasha moved in with me. Back then, she had just finished high school and had decided she wanted to attend the drama school in my area. I didn't mind her moving in. We've been pretty close almost from the start, seeing how we've been family since childhood. That was the expected outcome of our relationship with one another. Obviously, we started off awkwardly like most siblings do, especially kids, but the death of her, I mean, our father in an accident that had almost ended her life bonded us rather quickly. As far as everyone is concerned, some asshole flew into father's car from the side, flipping it over. To this day, she says she can still recall the face of the driver, as apparently he looked into the car before storming off. Hell, I don't even know if I should believe her. I mean, she had a vertebrae compressed and was lying upside down next to the body of her dying father. I doubt she was in a clear state of mind. Anyhow, she moved in and it was all fine and dandy. We shared similar interests. We were both forced to grow up quicker than usual so I could classify us both as mature enough not to do stupid shit. She had her drama studies and job and I had my job. The house chores were always taken care of and we had someone to hang around at all times. Honestly, if it weren't for her, I think I would have lost my mind to the loneliness. You see, I'm not much of a people person at this point. Fast forward to three months ago, a new neighbor moved into the house next door. A man in his early 50s, I'd say. Nothing strange about him other than his overgrown, graying facial hair. He was quite a sociable fellow. He came over and introduced himself as Paul Aronson. A fit, bully male followed him calmly as we spoke. Paul told me that the pooch was his harmless best friend. I honestly had no idea why he had to mention the fact that it was harmless, perhaps due to the fact that pit bulls tend to have a bad reputation. I'm a dog guy myself, so the odd dog wouldn't bother me in the slightest. We talked, shared a beer I had in my fridge, and when the sun started setting, Paul went on his merry way. I fixed some dinner for me and my sister afterwards. Some time later, the front door flew ajar. Sasha made her way, marching through the entrance hall and into the kitchen, her bag still draped over her shoulder. She looked as if she'd seen a ghost. Hey, Sash. Dude, that's him. What? That's the guy who ran into me and Dad. I was dumbfounded. I had no idea what she was talking about, but I could tell that she was having a mild panic attack. Her eyes were bulging and wide open, her breath was quick and shallow, and she seemed to be shimmering due to the stress. I walked up to her and asked, What? Who are you talking about? The guy next door. With the dog. That's the guy. I interrupted her. No way. You can't know what he looks like, sis. Come on. Even if you did see him then, there's no way you could clearly remember the man's face from over a decade ago. I hope you're right. She said, visibly trying to calm herself down. She did have PTSD after the accident, but we were pretty sure that that was taken care of. Sasha had been seeing a therapist for a while and eventually went on to practice martial arts and acrobatics as part of her physical therapy. I put my hand on her head, ruffled her hair, and told her with a warm smile on my face, You look a mess. Go get a shower. She gritted her teeth and begrudgingly followed my advice. By the time she was back from the shower, dinner had already been served. She seemed tense for the rest of the evening, but whenever she was trying to change the subject of discussion towards this idea that our neighbor was the man who almost ended her life, I would subtly avoid the topic. Following that evening, Sasha seemed to be slipping ever so slowly back into a traumatized state. She was stressed, couldn't sleep properly, and in a matter of a couple of weeks, she'd become easily agitated and pissy, almost lashing out at me on several occasions. The lack of sleep, coupled with education and work, caused more stress, which in turn caused more deprivation of proper rest. It had gotten so bad that she wasn't just experiencing vivid nightmares or even night terrors. She had started sleepwalking. I kept my contact with my new neighbor as minimal as possible to avoid the ire of my younger sister. Occasionally, I could hear her almost shout something in her dreams. Horrible stuff kept coming out of her mouth during her night terrors. One night, I was awoken by the sound of something crashing in the yard. I made my way cautiously to the outside just to find my sister, sitting there in her nightgown with one of my switchblades in hand. The scene jolted me into a fully awakened state. Imagine seeing your sister sat outside in the middle of the night with a knife in hand. 
She seemed confused, and I guess I did too. I rushed up to her and helped her up, asking what she was doing. I don't know. It seemed like she had sleepwalked all the way into the yard with a switchblade in hand. I don't even know how she got it out of my room without me noticing. I kept those things in an old drawer that should have made enough noise to raise the dead from their sleep when opened. We sat there, silent for a few moments. Eventually, she broke the silence, saying, Maybe I should leave. All of this, it's too much. I was caught off guard by that remark. I didn't want to seem like the man who couldn't keep his sister safe, so I retorted with, Don't be silly. You're just burnt out. We'll get you a therapist, and you're having spring break soon, aren't you? You'll get your rest. Perhaps you'll see someone new. You don't have to leave. Look at me. I'm holding a knife. Who knows what I'll do next time I sleepwalk. You'll be fine, I, I promise. I poked her on the head and motioned her into the house. Fine. She hissed as she lagged behind me. The next day went remarkably well. She seemed more relaxed and jolly than she did in the past few weeks. However, all of that went down the drain the next night. I went to bed like usual. She was already sound asleep by that point. I remember falling asleep like that moment between sleeping and wakefulness. I felt something tug at me. My mind went into a half-waking mode because I was that tired after so many noisy nights courtesy of Sasha's sleepwalking. While my vision was still blurry and my hearing wasn't quite straight, I heard my sister's voice utter the words, The dog killed father. I straightened myself up and cleared my eyes. Sasha was on her way out of my room. Once I realized she must have been sleepwalking again, I got out of bed and called her name, but she wouldn't respond. So I went after her and grabbed her by the shoulder. I wish I hadn't. She turned her head at me. With this hollow stare, her blue eyes shined under the moonlight as she was staring right through me. She said, Good night. Turned her head forward and kept on walking towards her room. I froze in my tracks. That sight, that almost soulless stare. It was so terrifying. I told her about it the next day and she understandably found it hilarious, noting that sleepwalkers tend to look like that when they are sleepwalking. The day went on as usual. I had come back home from work before she was done with school, around 6 p.m. once she was back home. I was about to fix us dinner, but Paul showed up at the door, asking if we had seen his dog, claiming he couldn't find it. I asked Sasha if she had seen the bully, but she denied seeing it. She did utter under her tongue that it serves him right to lose his dog. This made me kind of suspicious of her having done something to the dog, mainly setting it free or something stupid of the sort, but I didn't say anything. Instead, I opted to help the aging man find his lost companion. After four hours of looking around, literally everywhere, for that damn dog, we found nothing and Paul gave up offering me a drink at his place. I had the feeling he called me over so that he wouldn't break apart over the possible loss of the dog. I got that, and so I accepted his offer. At his place, he started telling me about how he got his dog, Brutus, after he was starting to succumb to alcoholism almost a decade ago. He told me that this dog, this animal, had cured his alcoholic tendencies by forcing him to take responsibility of something. He kept on going and going about how he lost his wife and the custody of his children after he made a stupid decision. That was when something in my mind snapped as if some gears that were dormant started spinning all over. He told me, Years ago, man, I ran into a car. It flipped over. I stopped, I peered inside and saw this man. He was done. His body was twisted in angles the human body shouldn't be, and, and the little girl, her eyes were barely open, just barely. They were blue like your sister's. I was scared. I was confused. I, I didn't know what to do. I ran away. I, I should have stayed. Should have tried to help him. I should have... He began tearing up. I grabbed him by the shoulder and told him it was all fine, that we all make mistakes. We just have to let go. He wiped his face and kept on going. I, I couldn't let go, man. The guilt. It ain't me alive. I killed two people. I killed a child. So I turned to the bottle and sold everything for some of that sweet burning hell. He kept on going. If it wasn't for Brutus, I would have been done for. 
At this point, I was pretty sure he was the man who ended up killing my father. I couldn't be around him for much longer. I could feel the rage building up inside of me. If I had stayed there for much longer, I would have killed the man. So, being polite, I excused myself and walked back home, falsely promising to help him keep looking for that dog. I got back home to find my sister watching TV. I sat next to her and put my arm around her and said, You were right, sleepwalking monster. She looked at me, slightly baffled. Huh? She uttered, Our neighbor just confessed to me to running into a car with a man and a young girl inside. So, I guess he was the one who ran into you. Her eyes widened and she straightened up, staring at me with a glow. So what do we do now? I poked her head and said, Well, nothing we can do. I don't have his confession recorded, so unless he turns himself in, there's nothing much we can do. Her face radiated disappointment at me once I said that. But you know what? I doubt he's ever getting that dog of his back. I smiled. She started gleaming again, curiously asking me, What did you do? Nothing. We looked for his dog in every possible hole. It's gone. I bet someone thought it's a stray dog or something and put it in their soup. I half joked. Ew, that's gross. She remarked at me. We started watching the TV together and then I asked her casually, Hey, Sasha, you didn't do anything to that dog, did you? Nope, not stupid enough. She retorted without even turning her gaze away from the TV. The days flew by and Paul Aronson kept on searching desperately for his dog, and I kept avoiding his calls for help any time he'd ask. A week had gone by and the dog wasn't found. Another passed and still nothing came up. At this point, he even stopped asking for help. A couple of weeks ago, I was awoken by the sound of police sirens coming out of Paul's yard. I got up and dragged myself outside to see what the whole commotion was about. The sight wasn't pleasant, to say the least. Paul was crying on the floor, cuddling what appeared to be a dog's bloodied skin rug with a collar around its neck area. I looked around for a moment or two and then noticed the Arabic inscription. It was written on Paul's door in blood. The inscription means something along the lines of what goes around comes around. On top of that, various bloody handprints were smeared all over the door and walls of Paul's house. Me. My sister and pretty much the whole neighborhood were questioned by the police. Apparently some sick fuck decided they should skin the dog. The body itself wasn't found. Sasha told them about her sleepwalking issue, but the cops dismissed it as a task way too complicated to complete in a sleepwalking state. We all felt sorry for Paul and offered to help him in any way he'd like us to, but he decided that he just wanted to leave town. He's about to leave tomorrow morning and the cops still haven't found anything in regards to who killed the dog. Sasha and I decided to make a farewell dinner for Paul before he leaves. Speaking of which, Sasha's no longer wary of him and seems to have returned to her normal, lively self. Paul agreed to have dinner with us tonight. I just hope he's going to like the dog steak I've prepared for him.